Amen. Good morning again. If you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 103. Book of Psalms, chapter 103. There is a phenomenon that happens two times a year. Not for the other 363 days out of the year, but for two different days, there is a phenomenon that takes place that I think is just mystical, and that happens to be today on Father's Day and on August 28th on my birthday. I wake up with an aroma in my home of a pot, a pot of brown beans. Can I have a witness? Amen. I'm just telling you up front, I'm happy this morning. I woke up and I'm like, oh, I love my wife. I, I, I could smell it just coming down the hallway in there and I felt like I just floated in here. So if I just get too happy today, then you can blame the beans. Um, but it's brown beans, cornbread, and fried taters. Can I have a witness? Amen. See, I'm not, I'm not complicated. That's all it takes to get to my heart, all right? I'm not complicated. I'm pretty simple. You don't have to take me into town. Cornbread, cornbread brown beans, fried taters. I just had to get that off my chest and acknowledge my sweet honey this morning. What's that got to do with your message? Nothing. Let's read our text, Psalm 103. If, if you've been around Crescent Valley for a while, this will be a familiar passage. It's become one of my absolute favorite psalms where I can just really just take a, a day to just encourage you by bragging on Jesus. And it says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who and not and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. Who y'all just sat there, okay? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things? so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses. He acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. I love verse 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. If y'all were Pentecostal, you'd already fell out on the floor right there. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But the, mm, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. 
Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Lord, take this psalm and speak into our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This morning, I want to take my time and speak to you about Jesus, my heavenly Father. Jesus, my heavenly Father. Our um, Bible, as you know, is really just pregnant with this truth that Jesus is a good, good Father. That he's a a father to his children and not just a father, but he is the portrait, the picture of a father. The Bible is also pregnant with helps of truth that, that teach us as dads, as men, how to be a father. And really, in a sense, the impact that our lives, and I'm gonna go a step further, our decisions have on our family. A clear example that you'll find of this throughout your uh, Bible, uh, one of those in particular, is found in Genesis chapters 19, 13, and 22. And it's in the story that's a, a, a contrast between two men. One of those is a man by the name of Abraham, uh, and another is a, a man by the name of Lot. Their stories really are fascinating. And you don't have to dig far into their stories to see that these two men, um, though they had the same opportunities, lived very different lives. And as a result of that, it had a massive effect on their family, an an unbelievable effect on their family. We don't have time to to go into that because we're coming to this psalm today. But I'll just give you a, a couple of thoughts of why I would say that would impact their family and, and, and what the contrast was. First of all, if you look at these two men and their story, and that's your homework of the week, okay? Go read those three chapters. It won't take you long, and you'll see the story. But I want you to notice what these two men were looking at as the focal point in their life. When you look at Abraham, Abraham was looking at the promises of God. That's what his eyes, his attention was focused on. When you look at the story of Lot, Lot, the Bible says that he pitched his tents toward Sodom. He pitched his tents toward Sodom. In other words, uh, Lot's focus had become on the world. Now, again, you, if any of you uh, familiar with the story, you know that the story of Sodom and the story of Gomorrah uh, are, are, is, is a great tragedy in the Bible. It was a people that were overtaken with uh, sinfulness, and really the, the sin that was driving it was the sin of homosexuality. That was the driving force of what was going on. I know in our culture that's not PC to say that. Well, it was just some sexual sin. Well, yeah, it may have just been sexual sin, but it was specific, the sin of homosexuality. And what Lot did was Lot had set himself up in a way as that was what he was looking at day after day. In other words, dads, it's important that we understand what we're giving attention to and looking at has an impact on our life. Second thing, you'll notice where these two were living, a great contrast. Lot chose the city of Abraham while Ab- while a- or the city of Sodom while Abraham was living in the place that God had promised him. God had said, I'm going to give this to you as the promised land. Go and live in it, and I will multiply your seed. And if your seed could be counted, in other words, your children could be counted, then so also could the sand on the seashore. Lot, however, chose the city of Sodom, to live. You look at where they were leading. Lot had become so compromised in his life at this point when the time came to leave Sodom, because if you'll remember, God had only spared Sodom because of Abraham's prayers. But it finally came to a point where he sends two angels to go in. When these two angels go in to get Lot and his family out, They bring them in, and immediately what happens, the men of the city come to Lot's house and ask Lot, send those two men out, these two angels, so that we can have our way with them. 
Lot wouldn't allow it to happen. Eventually, the angels would strike those men blind. What happens next is they tell Lot, get your family out. Lot couldn't do it. Well, why couldn't he do it? Because he was a compromised man. Whenever you become compromised in your walk, and in your integrity, you no longer have a grounds in which to lead from. Man, I'm telling you that there, you've missed about five or six amen spots. That was a good one. When you want to become a leader, I'm telling you the greatest platform of your leadership comes from integrity. Lot had so messed this up when time came to get out of town, he could not lead his family out. However, contrast that with when you read the story in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham leads his son, his only son Isaac, up Mount Moriah to worship God and he also leads him back down. Also, and lastly, look at the legacy that these two men left. Lot left a legacy of two nations that were tumultuous nations as a result of immorality. Again, you'll find it in the story. Abraham left a legacy of sons and grandsons and daughters and granddaughters that worshiped and followed God. Where did it all stay? It started with what they were looking at. It started at what became the focal point of their life. Point being, dads, our decisions have generational impact, which is why we must choose Jesus as our model of being a father. And so, well, I've had some bad circumstances. It's been hard. Well, it's, guess what? That's called life. I'm not minimizing your pain or your struggle, but yet we find a ton of help here again in the word of men that have gone through struggles. For instance, King David, King David, 1 Samuel chapter 30, it says, but it says, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. I'm guessing most of you aren't facing that right now. But he was distressed because of that. And it says, because of, uh, of the, the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But here's where I'm getting to. It says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. In other words, men, at the end of the day, if you know Christ as Father, as Savior, as Redeemer, he's saying that you have the ability to strengthen yourself in the Lord. Whether you're getting help, whether you're getting encouragement or coaching, you can strengthen yourself in the Lord. I want to look here at this psalm this morning quickly that gives us this great picture of what it is, of why we would call Jesus a heavenly father, what he has done for us. First of all, I want you to notice here in the text as David writes it, he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. He's, in a sense, he's commanding himself. You need to do this. Men, we sometimes need to kind of, tell ourselves this is good to do even when we don't want to. Amen. Being a good dad is not always about gee whiz and hallelujah. Amen. It's not always glamorous. Getting up and going to church isn't always gee whiz and hallelujah. It isn't always glamorous. But sometimes we need to tell ourselves, this is right, this is good, this is why we do it. And he said, bless the Lord, oh my soul, forget not all his benefits. Why would he say that? Why? Because we have a tendency to forget. What happens when we forget his benefits? Well, we start complaining. Amen. Or oh me. Um, think about it. In your life, what happens, this is for everybody, what happens when you forget all the benefits of God? You start thinking life just, just ain't fair. Right? I mean, you just kind of start the, the, the whinies a little bit. And, and then you'll try to see if you can find somebody else that will whine with you. Well, he's saying, no, you need to remember, don't forget the benefits of God. What are they? Thanks for asking. Let's look. Number one, he's a forgiving father. Look in verse three. Who forgives all your iniquities. He forgives them all. There's not a sin. I don't know who needs this. There's not a sin he won't forgive in your life. Some of you are testing him on that. You're like, I'm, I'm going to see him. No, you, you can't, you can't out sin him. He, I don't know, what is that? It's a what? A coal? I don't know what that means. So I just now saw it. Um, what was I saying? Sorry. What was I saying? 
Hey, he's a better savior than you are a sinner. Y'all all right with that? He's a better savior than you are a sinner. Some of you are really good at sinning. I'm talking like Olympic medal sinning stuff. I'm, you can't out sin him. You, you just can't sin so much that he's like, golly, I'm going to have to die twice for that one. No, 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 no. He, 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 listen to me. His death on the cross paid it all. This is why whenever he stretched out his arms upon the cross, he yells out this word to tell us die. It is finished. It's complete. There's nothing else to be paid. He's a forgiving father. Secondly, the text says he's a healing father for us. A healing father. Look at, look at there in the same verse, verse three. It says, who heals all your diseases. That's what he, he gives to us. He's the healer. He, there's not a sickness that's greater than God. I don't care whether it's that one that the doctor's like, there's only three of you in the world. Okay, you're not stumping him. He heals all our diseases. Now, let me give you a little sidebar. He ain't always going to do that the way you want him to. He's not always going to do that in the time frame that you want him to. Should we still ask? Should we still believe? 1,000% yes. 1,000% we should come and believe him for healing. Oh, God, instantly take cancer from me. Instantly, Lord, I want to believe you for, for, for taking this disease out of me. Absolutely. All the way down to a, 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 a bellyache or indigestion. Ask him. Believe him. But please understand I don't care what the TV preacher told you. You're not God, and you don't get to dictate terms to him for how and when he heals. Are y'all okay? You say, well, how come he heals this way over here? Now, let me give you a deep answer for that. Why does he heal this one this way and this one this way? Why, preacher? Settle it. I'm, I'm, I'm fitting to you. You ready? Lean in. Don't miss this. I have no idea. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that I have no idea. Listen to me. I'm not God. I don't want to play God. I don't want to. I don't want to. You thank Jesus today. You're, I'm not your God. I'd zap some of you. Amen. I'd get you in line. I'm not him. You, you, y'all remember when we, when we pray, part of that prayer, uh, cowboy, is, is us acknowledging he is in charge. It's the same principle, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross. Oh God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, well, I'm so glad that word's in there. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's how we pray for healing. God, I want to be healed. I want my grandma to be healed. I want my, my dog to be healed. I, well, whatever you're praying for. I didn't mean to compare grandma to dog, but you, anyway, Asking for all, believing for all of it. But in that prayer, listen, resign to the fact that, Lord, you know all, you see all. I do not. If you choose to do it this way, that's great. If you don't, I'm still going to praise the Lord. He's a healing father. In verse, verse 4, he's a redeeming father. You see it there? Who redeems your life from destruction, redeems. That, that, that word redeems is a picture of paying the price for something. It's to, to purchase something back. He did that for you. This is the picture of Christ on the cross to lay down his life for you. It's a, it's a, it's a, in, a, in a sense, this is what we are called to as dad. We give our life for our kids we, we, I mean, think about that. That it, Once those babies, dads get here, it ain't about you no more. Amen. Amen. It just isn't. It ain't, it ain't about you no more. All of a sudden now, what they want just becomes front and center. And I'm like, when they start paying amen, they can get, amen, write a check. It ain't about us. It's, it's about giving ourselves to someone else. It's about doing all that we can do for their benefit. 
But even in so much of a greater way, the text is telling us that God has sent his son Jesus to redeem us from destruction, meaning that that's where every person in this room is headed without Christ. Destruction, eternal destruction. Not only is he a redeeming father, and I love this one, he is a satisfying father. Verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things. Now, I'd love to tell you that that means that it's Krispy Kremes all around, amen? And brown beans and cornbread, that's not really what he's meaning. The word mouth here is the word, uh, I don't know why it gets translated this way, but it's the word old age, it, 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 he satisfies your old age with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord, verse 8, is slow and mer- is, is, is merciful and gracious, and he's slow to anger, abounding in mercy. The idea here is he satisfies us. And, uh, translate that. He's enough. I don't have to live life in want. I don't have to live life just when I always had a better God, better life. No, no, no. If I have nothing in this world in regards to material things, Jesus is enough. He's enough. And and somebody said this way, until you come to that place, you're never going to be satisfied here on this earth. Why? You'll always need a bigger house. You'll always need more money. You'll always need a a prettier dress, girls. Guys, you'll always need a faster truck. You'll You'll always need more. And it'll never satisfy. When you come to a place in this life where you understand Jesus is enough, he satisfies my soul, I'm just telling all the rest of it's just it's just filler. It's just stuff. And you'll hold it a lot loose, more loosely. In other words, it's, it's, you don't live life just gripped on to stuff. And I, boy, I've, I've battled with this my whole life. I grew up, didn't have a lot of stuff. And so whenever I got to I can get some stuff, I want to hang on to it. I'm sure I'm the only one. Thanks for the judgment. Amen. Uh, uh, I'm the only one that battles with it. And I've, I've said for years, this is one of the benefits for me uh, of going on international mission trips like I'm going to do Tuesday morning with our team is I come back and I'm a whole lot less materialistic. Why? Because I see folks that have nothing. I, I'm talking about nothing. Maybe an old uh, hut that's made out of mud and poop. Uh, just just a, a hut. And there are some of the most joyful people I've ever run into in my life just praising Jesus. And their church building is an old broom tree or a, uh, just an old nasty tree out in the middle of a village. Why? They're, they're satisfying. He's enough. I, I, in my life, the more I get, the more I want. You buy me a new gun, I think I ought to have another one. Amen? What's, anyway, what's wrong with it? He's a satisfying father. He's a righteous father. Verse six says, the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all those who are oppressed. Why is that important? It's important because you didn't have any. It's important because without it, you'll go to hell. It's important because when he gives that to you, he's given you access now to the heavenly father with the righteousness of his son, Jesus. You please get that. Don't, don't, don't just skip past that. Oh, get the righteousness. No. The, the Bible would declare you and I bankrupt on the area of righteousness. The, the, the word of God says that our righteousness that we've conjured up like a pile of filthy rags. But he's imputed righteousness. In other words, he's deposited that in our account while we were in the red. And lastly, verse 14, look down there at it. He's an understanding Father, for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Under heaven, what does that mean? When it says he knows our frame, he was he sees the beginning. God's not restrained by time like you and I. We're restrained by the calendar. I live by, I've got a calendar on my phone. And every day if you say, hey, what are you doing? The first thing I'm going to do is look at that stupid little calendar on my phone because it just dictates this is what I'm doing. I'm, I guess I'm the only one does that too. Amen. Thank you. I feel all you. And I look at it and that's what it is. I'm constrained and you're constrained by time. God's not. He sees the beginning of your life. He sees the last breath that you will 
breathe. He knows our frame. And the Bible declares, look at the text again, he remembers we're dust. It also said that your life is like the grass, right? The grass comes, it's green right now. Hey, guess what? I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I work for a nonprofit organization. But I'm telling you, something's coming. Your green grass is fitting to turn brown. It's coming. How do you know? Oklahoma. That's how I know. It happens every year. He knows that's our life. We think we have forever to get life settled. We think we have forever to make a decision about Jesus. Some folks will say, I've still got some living left to do. Ma'am and sir, I would submit, you don't know what living is like. You don't know what living is about until you come to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. He literally is the darling that we find on every page of the scriptures from front to back, from Genesis to Revelation. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. That's what your Bible says. Is that right? He began this and he is going to be at the end of it. He is the keeper of creation and he's the creator of all. He's the architect of the universe and he's the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. The Bible would declare he is unmoved and unchanged and undefeated and he is never undone. He was bruised yet he brings healing. He was pierced and yet he eases your and I's pain. He was persecuted yet he brings freedom. He was dead and he is brought now to life. He is risen and he brings power. He reigns and now he brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him away. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him and the people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The new age can't replace him and Oprah can't explain him away. Y'all just be quiet for a moment. He is light. He is love. He is longevity and he is Lord. He is goodness and kindness and gentleness and he is God Almighty. He is holy and righteous. He is mighty and powerful. He is pure. He is, his ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging. His mind is on me. He is my redeemer. He's my savior. He's my God. He is my peace. He is my joy and he is my comfort. He is my Lord and he rules my life. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives. When I'm weak, he is strong. When I am lost, he is the way. When I am afraid, he is my courage and my strength. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm blind, he leads me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I am hungry, hey man, he feeds me. And when I face trials, he's right there by my side and he is with me. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he's going to carry me home. He's everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, in every way. He is God and he is faithful. I am his. He is mine and he wants to be yours. The ball today is in your court. His work is complete. His offer is good. And he's saying to you this morning, why not just come to me? Trust him. Try him. He says, taste and see that I am good. You don't believe me? Just come and taste.